Well, um, as I mentioned, Dr. Michael Truong is, um, is not unfamiliar to ICHE, and he's, he's participating in one of our ICHE member institutions. He led in our, one of our resource tracks at a regional conference, and of course, earlier, um, uh, earlier in, in our day, you know, 12 hours ago or thereabouts, did this workshop with about 35 or so folks from the other side of the world where the sun is no longer up. Um, and we planned it that way so that Southeast Asia, India, Kyrgyzstan uh, were all represented in schools from, uh, from those places. And uh, so, so this is the second in this series of online learning during the pandemic. Uh, Mike is, as I mentioned, involved, and you already know Don Dawson, who chairs the board of, of Union and a uh, school that reaches into Vietnam. Mike is also on the faculty at Azusa Pacific University, and this is an area where he excels and is working with the faculty and staff at that university as well. So, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, we all want to know which beach you are at that we see off your right shoulder. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kevin, for uh, the introduction and uh, welcome to everybody. I think most people are either good morning or good afternoon. Uh, last night, uh, well, or my first session, I had to say good morning, good afternoon, good night to the folks that were on uh, the webinar because there were folks you now spanning the, the horizon. Uh, so, I am, I will answer your question, Kevin, about my background, maybe towards the end, because now it may keep people uh, intrigued in the process. Um, so my name is Mike Trong, and I am just super grateful and excited to be here today to share with you uh, a topic that is dear uh, to me, and I'm very passionate about it. A uh, little bit about myself, um, I, you know, I served as the digital learning architect and the uh, executive director of the Office of Innovative Teaching and Technology at APU. And I also volunteer as the chief academic officer at Union University of California, where Don Dawson served as the board chair. Uh, and UUC is uh, the first Christian online university serving the people in Vietnam and beyond. It's actually founded, it's, we're celebrating our 36th year of, of, uh, of life over at Union. And when Dr. Manoia invited me to share in the resource track in Zurich, I, I was like, that's a lot of work to prepare for in a resource track because I did this last year and I, I thought I was gonna do the same topic, which was on teaching and learning the fourth industrial revolution. But then COVID-19 hit and then it literally just changed everything for everyone. And, and so I had to basically go back to the well and just start, and, start afresh and I uh, spent you know, a few weeks building up this talk as you will see today and I hope that what you will get out of it will be a lot of in good information but more than that that you will feel empowered that you'll have a lot of resources and that you'll have some guide like guidelines and how to go forward to either start or sustain or to grow online learning at your institution. Um, Prior to COVID-19, I think online learning in the global higher education landscape uh, was considered for the most part peripheral, you know, I think, uh, if not optional or even non-existent in some places. But I think the, the event of the pandemic uh, it really forced online learning to be, uh, it forced it on every student, every teacher, every institution globally. And uh, the webinar today, I hope, uh, we'll explore a little bit about how online learning uh, needs to be attended to you know, going forward. You know, as you know, Kevin said earlier, uh, online learning is not going to go away anytime soon. If anything, it, was, it will grow in its prominence and its role in, uh, in higher education. So with that, uh, I'm going to go forward and get into my talk. So words matter uh, because meaning matters. 
Now, people can use the same words uh, to mean very different things and vice versa. People can use different words to mean the same thing. So let me take a minute or two sort of to make sure that we're on the same page when we uh, use certain words during this okay. webinar. What happened with COVID-19 shutting down schools and colleges and universities is that what most institutions did was they did this thing called remote uh, learning or emergency remote learning, which is this really quick uh, a low uh, quality ad hoc uh, mitigation strategy. Uh, their main goal was just to get things online as quick as possible. There was very little design considerations. Um, and what most of what I'll talk about today is actually uh, you know, the, the normative understanding of online learning is this idea that the, the learning experiences in these online courses are very uh, exquisitely designed and, and the, um, considered in terms of what it will do to student learning or how it can facilitate and maximize student learning. Um, when you think about online learning, there's actually quite a history to that. Uh, I had to do some research on this and you know, those who are in theological education understand that you know, correspondence courses have been going on for a while. I didn't realize that it's been going on for over a century and a half. Uh, and then you know, we have things like tele-education. This is in, you know, when the television was invented, that's when things, you know, people would take courses, watch something and they would sort of do that kind of course interaction. And then, uh, and you can see through the, the 90s and the 2000s, things started evolving. You have different terminologies used to refer to online learning, you know, distance education, e-learning. And then I think the, the modern day reference to online learning is usually one of those three things. You know, it's the synchronous online learning, which is the real time. That's what's similar to what we're doing right now. It's, uh, we have to meet in this real time but you can be from anywhere. Whereas asynchronous is where it's a self-paced. You know, we don't have to set aside a real time to meet and talk. Rather, a course is fully developed and students can log in, do their work at any time and be able to complete the work at their own pace. And then the, the third would be sort of the more commonly understood um, courses that a lot of people have heard about and they're called MOOCs or Massively Open Online Courses. These are ones offered by Udacity and edX and you know, many, many other uh, ven uh, schools and, and companies that are trying to really uh, scale online learning for the masses. So just today, I'll be using the terminology online learning, but uh, as you can see, it's, there's a rich history that goes behind that. So COVID-19 um, can be seen as a one-time event. It can be seen as a season, and it also can be seen as an era. So Andy Crouch, uh, the former editor of Christianity Today in the US and his colleagues uh, wrote an article that I thought was very insightful right at the beginning of when the US started shutting down its schools. Um, and the reference to the article is there. And like I said, I will share the slides with you later so you can read uh, up later. Um, but you know, they, they provided these three ways of thinking about the event. You know, a blizzard is an event in the sense that when it happens, you can't go out. There's zero visibility, it's hostile condition, and the key is to shelter and just to hunker down. You know, just wait it out for the day or two or whenever the, the blizzard is over. But COVID-19 was more than just an event. You know, they argue that it was a season. It was the beginning of a winter season. And when you think about a winter season, uh, you have to wear protective gear. You have to check the forecast to make sure that there's no storms coming. You have to plan and prepare differently. Uh, your activities get modified. Uh, and so there, there's a, a lot of adjustments that need to be made. You know, surviving a few days of a blizzard is different than surviving three months of winter. And more than that, they argue that the you know, pandemic was really the beginning of a little ice age. Um, you know, things don't grow the way they used to in an ice age. You know, the way we live and even the way we thrive will look different. You know, societies, institutions uh, will need to make you know, major fundamental shifts you know, to be able to live in the, the little ice age that they call. And they referenced this uh, event in 1860. 
2018, uh, known as the year without a summer. So there was an eruption in Mount uh, Tambora in modern day Indonesia. And that uh, eruption of volcano led to a worldwide ash plume that reduced solar radiation and caused widespread crop failure and unprecedented uh, cold temperatures around the world, you know, from Europe to North America. Literally, there, were, there was no summer that year around the world because of that, you know, the, the, the cloud. And in many ways, you know, that event um, signaled you know, to, to uh, clim uh, climatologists saying that this little ice age, you know, it, it actually had impacts for several you know, decades you know, going forward because it impacted temperature. And likewise, um, I think Crouch and his colleagues, and, and I would like to argue also, I agree with them that this COVID-19 pandemic is a one-time event but it's also a season and it's also an era. You know, it will fundamentally change things as we know it. This here shows you uh, just one way that the US schools are thinking about how COVID-19 is going to impact them. Uh, you will see here, um, this immediate phase one was, you know, you could say that's the blizzard, if you will, but an immediate event in the couple of weeks or that happened, how did schools adjust it? And that was really a rapid transition, you know, to, to online courses without really much consideration. I've heard of schools where they, they, they just told their faculty, just dump your materials online. You don't have to organize it, just put it online. And that was the only instructions they were given. Uh, but then you know, we realized that this is actually more than a couple of days or weeks, and it's gonna have to go through the summer and you know, phase two kicked in. And that's where you know, schools and some instructors have to begin to think about and consider some design things that they never would have thought about or didn't have time to think about. And then if you look further down the road to this coming fall and to the next academic year uh, beyond, uh, there are real unknowns that we just don't know how to, you know, how to prepare for. Um, schools are, I think less than 50% of the schools in the United States are clear about what they will do in the fall. Uh, I think for sure um, in California, the state I'm in, uh, the community colleges and the state colleges have decided to do online going into the fall because of uncertainty. Um, the, I mean, the private schools are divided. Some schools are doing online, some schools are face-to-face -face, and others are doing a mix. Uh, even if you know, like APU um, with its big uh, on ground uh, presence, we still don't know. We're still deciding on what to do. And so really this is where I think where most people are at uh, in terms of their re response to uh, this pandemic. This is just a global perspective. Uh, when COVID-19 hit, uh, 1.38 billion students. That represents 17% of the world's population. You know, uh, this UNESCO infographic, I think it illustrates a couple of things. Um, that 600 million of the students enrolled in colleges and universities you know, as part of that 1.638 billion uh, were impacted in, in dramatic ways. Uh, the lockdown in many ways accelerated online learning never imagined before. Uh, I've been in the field of online learning for over a decade and I in my uh, never in my life as a professional would I imagine that a virus of all things can accelerate online learning and be the biggest advocate for online learning. I just you know, never would have thought of that. In higher education there's a concept called the Iron Triangle. And basically what this concept refers to is this, there are three interlocking challenges that face uh, higher education. It's the issue of access. Uh, how do you increase uh, educational access to more students? At the same time, I think there's a, a desire or a need to control costs or to decrease costs. And so how do you, you know, do that in the midst of you know, educating more students? And finally, how do you improve quality in the process? And so this iron triangle, you know, this is something I talk a lot about when I teach in higher ed course here at APU, is how do you uh, teach more students with less resources and do a better job? You know, more, less, better, more, less, better. And any educational reformer that have faced these 
iron, you know, the, 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 these constraints recognizes that if you can address any one of these pieces, uh, or if you can actually ideally address all three of them together, you found something that is profoundly important and that needs to be you know, attended to. And I would argue um, online learning is one of those things that can solve all three issues at the same time. Um, this is a traditional um, bell curve uh, that is often used to represent uh, the traditional technology adoption bell, uh, distribution. Uh, what you see on the left here is what they call the early market. Uh, you have innovators and you have early adopters. So when there's a new technology that comes out, for example, the new iPod or the new iPhone, uh, you have the innovators and the early adopters who are willing to invest their time and money to get their hands on that product. And it may not work perfectly, but they're okay. They're willing to be the first one to in exchange for sort of the less than perfect product. But then to the right of the chasm is this sort of the rest of the market, the mainstream market. And you have the early majorities, your late majorities and your laggards. And these are the folks that they need to know that this thing is gonna work. They, they want to know that you know, this is reliable, that it's going to be high quality, it's going to be a little failure. And, and in many ways, the reason why the chasm exists, you know, the, there was a book in 1999 that was written by Jeffrey Moore called The, the Chasm, Crossing the Chasm. And he talked about this idea that um, the, the early adopters and the innovators uh, are a small group of people representing maybe 15% of the, the entire population. Whereas the majority of people, you know, up to 85%, know that there's this gap that exists. And the question is, how do you cross this chasm? And you know, prior to pre-COVID-19, when it comes to online learning, online, um, it was really done and adopted and invested by the early adopters and the innovators. But because of COVID-19, it has forced everybody to become an online user, regardless of their feelings, regardless of their preferences, regardless of their resources. I mean, it just, it became just a reality for so many people. And because of that, um, this is a, a clip from Disney's Hercules song called uh, From Zero to Hero, which is where I got my title. Uh, my kid, I have three kids and you know, they're Disney fans. And this is a song that we came across recently. And um, now online learning has the potential to break the iron triangle. It has the potential to cross the chasm. And because of you know, those two things, I think it will have an unprecedented role and prominence in the 21st so century. In the remaining time, I want to kind of cover these five topics when it comes to online learning. And I wanted to say a couple of things about these topics. Um, these are five big areas. I actually can spend two hours or more on each of these topics easily, but I wanted to kind of give more of a comprehensive view, but at the same time, empower you with resources to follow up on you know, uh, with your colleagues and at your own institution. So uh, I will have you know, resources and I will have questions that will guide your discussions after this webinar that you can take with you. Um, so I will go ahead and start talking about leadership uh, in online learning. So the topic of leadership in online learning has been around for at least two decades, at least from the literature that I've been looking at. And as early as 1999, there was a study that was done about how distance ed uh, leadership is an essential uh, role for the new century. You now this is you now back before the iPhone, before internet as we know it. Um, and, you know, and another study in 2001 basically said that senior administrators in universities and colleges, they need to invest in some sort of larger strategic plan for distance uh, education. And along with that, some sort of management or leadership structure to make this work for the entire university. There's a, a book uh, here by King and uh, Alperstein in 2015, which I found very helpful. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this book. And it talks about just the whole uh, from 
uh, birth to, you know, the birth of the online program to all the way how do you create it, how do you build it, to how to maintain it, and how to scale it. I mean, it's a very, very uh, helpful, resourceful book for me. And they say that you know, the first and most important, perhaps most important step is setting the framework uh, for the institution of online learning is identifying a strong in, um, institutional leadership for the effort. Um, without the leadership structure, without the administrative uh, backing, it will be very difficult you know, to make online learning uh, a success or at least you know, meaningful for the student learning experience. Um, and so the uh, centralized office you know, um, with some sort of leadership role would be helpful and it, it makes it very um, important to, for the institution and also for the students who are enrolled to know that there is sort of institutional resources and backing for it. Uh, one of the, I'd say the most important jobs of leaders uh, of online institutions and online programs is to really debunk online learning myths that still is very you know, potent in, in the field of education. Now, myths like you know, that online college students uh, is very similar to traditional students. And this is, may not be relevant to some of your institutions because you don't deal with undergrad. But a lot of times, you know, when we talk about undergrads in online courses, uh, there is a, a miss that happens in terms of, you know, traditional undergrad, uh, undergrad students who are used to face-to-face, -face, you know, they may not have never taken an online course before, may not do as well. And so that's something that we need to think about. But at the same time in the United States, um, there are more non, there are more older students taking online courses now in the U.S. than there are younger students. And I think the average age for online students is like close to 30, 29, 30 years old. And so that bring, uh, brings with it a very different demographics and that we have to really treat them differently and how we support them and how we interact with them. Another myth that I think online leaders need to think about or debunk is this idea that online success is really just about technical skills. Uh, it is more than that. We all know that. You know, clicking the right buttons is not going to be help you be successful in your online course. Um, and I think there are now a lot of uh, schools that do these almost screening processes that basically before a student uh, enrolled in an online course and online program, they would screen their students to make sure that they are ready, they're prepared, they have the right skill sets. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the, the success uh, characteristics of online students in a little bit uh, further uh, along in my talk, but that's something that you know, I think is important consideration for leaders to think about. Another myth is about online um, courses having inferior uh, outcomes compared to traditional courses. I hear this so often. So many of the people I interact with who are resistant towards online say, well, it's it just, it's war, it's less quality. It's just not good for a student and students don't learn as much. And I, you know, I, I can spend an hour giving you study after study after study debunking this. Um, the attrition rate, you know, the dropout rate of online courses have been, you know, said to be much higher. And that is true in some uh, settings, like for example, the MOOCs, the massively online courses have been well discussed and and debated and studied about you know, upwards of 80, 90% dropout rates. But we have to understand that those MOOC courses are not an online program or, or online courses that students would take in a typical program. Those are usually taken by professionals with advanced degrees and they're really on the courses, the MOOCs courses for additional professional development, not so much to pass the course or to get a certificate or degree. And then finally, this idea that students are less satisfied with online learning than traditional learning. I mean, that's something that has also been extensively studied. Um, it, this report, the Chloe, it's called Chloe 4. So this is the fourth edition of a report that's put out by the Changing Landscape of Online Education. That's what Chloe stands for. It's a um, organization, national organization that really tries to stay ahead of the online learning landscape. And you know, one of their 
you know, uh, highlights of every year that I always look forward to is this, this uh, there's this report and they, uh, they advocate that the chief online officer, the COO position is becoming an indispensable role at many schools, in, especially the face-to-face -face schools. Things that, you know, we, a role like this would never have existed, you know, even five or 10 years ago, but now it's becoming more common. There are 367 institutions in the United States uh, that has a comparable role, either a, C, a chief online officer role or a comparable role. And that just speaks to the six, six volume to where online learning is in the landscape. Uh, here's a little bit of what they do. Um, you know, it, everything ranges from uh, faculty training to instructional design to quality assurance to strategic planning and you know, many other you know, um, co-responsibilities that's related to that. So I think uh, if your institution has somebody who's overseeing this, I think this is something that would, you know, it's great. I'm glad to hear that. And if you don't, maybe, you know, this is a time to start thinking about those, you know, the, um, those leadership roles to really put some uh, institutional resources behind that. Here are just some basic questions uh, that I uh, have prepared for you that you can discuss with your colleagues at your institution. You know, questions about leadership, uh, questions about fit and mission, questions about um, the uh, integration of, of services and support needs for students in online setting. If you do have any questions, just add it into the chat so that I can uh, see those as I go along. I'll, I'll periodically check back. Okay. But let me, so this is uh, a infographic from UNESCO. I just pulled that uh, recently. And they said that you know, the, uh, it impacted 191 countries in terms of school closures. And you know, if you look more closely, it's really on the right side. That's really, I think, the, the really poignant statistics. Uh, they say that at almost half of the students affected worldwide face barriers to online learning because of uh, either not having computers, not having internet, or not having mobile networks. You know, these are major serious uh, challenges and barriers. And for some of our schools and who you know, are with students in uh, the other you know, part of the hemisphere, like Union, you know, most of our students are in Vietnam, and uh, including some of the, the villages and in the highlands of Vietnam, you know, internet access is not a real reliable thing. And so that, that is definitely something uh, we have to think about the way we, we design and the way we, uh, we do our courses. Uh, but I always encourage uh, folks to look at their local you know, uh, government or non-government agencies or businesses in their uh, surrounding to see if there are you know, resources that they can leverage. In the U.S., uh, we have the Federal Communications uh, Commission, and when COVID-19 hit, uh, they uh, activated this Keep Americans Connected um, initiative, and basically it involved 750 government, non-government, and private entities to basically provide Americans who have no or little access to computing devices, to internet, to be able to get those so that their kids can continue with their education during this period. So that's something that I always encourage people in there, uh, wherever they are, to look to see if there are resources from other places that they can find. Uh, when it comes to technology in higher education, it is overwhelming. I, I live and I work in this world and it is overwhelming. And so I can only imagine those who are you know, new to this or those who may not have thought about this for a lot of time uh, to really get a handle on it. And so um, this is just a, uh, a 2019 uh, tip of the iceberg uh, illustration of all the different technology tools. Uh, there's actually quite a bit more than this. If you were to list everything, it would probably be like you know, 10 screens of this type of, of vendors available. Um, but my point here is that uh, typically at an institution, there's a chief information officer, a CIO, and he or she is typically the person who makes decisions about technology and which one technology to use and how to use it and all those important decisions. Uh, but I think the, the, the point I want to make here is about that CIOs are more, they're treated more like plumbers than they are strategists. And this is what I mean. Plumbers, you only call them when there's a leak 
or when there's an issue with the pipes. Um, when things are working well, you don't need the plumber. Um, strategists, on the other hand, you know, you want them at the table. Uh, you want them to contribute to the decision making. You want them to speak into how you're planning and how you're strategizing about the growth and development of online learning. And that's something that I think needs to happen more and more at most institutions that don't relegate the, in, the technology person, the IT person to the side, but rather bring them in to, uh, to the table so that they can speak into what is best because I think this is where you know the technology infrastructure is so critical to to online learning that without that voice you are missing something important in the conversation. So what are the essential technologies uh, you need to make you know, to, um, online learning work and and again it may not be relevant to this audience as much as it is for the earlier audience I I would say that so the first group of technologies is basically the internet access uh, some sort of computing devices or mobile devices now that's sort of at the baseline without that it's very you just it's not possible really to do online learning and then this next category of tools are what they call learning management systems lms's um, i you know i know that most schools uh, online schools use a learning management system of some sort um, but some i was surprised to find out that actually don't i mean they do things via email or listservs or different ways of uh, like you no know, like facebook groups and things like that and and i think those things work but they're not going to be as effective and so i think it's important uh, to consider a learning management system or at least to make sure you have one that is robust enough to do what you need. Now, Google Classroom is a free learning management system that's used in K-12 uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, Moodle is also another very popular learning management system that's used. Now, Union uses Moodle. Um, and then Canvas uh, is you know, one of the newer ones. And there are uh, some costs associated with that, but they do have a free uh, open source version that you can get. And then finally, a third category of tools would be sort of these collaboration tools like Google Suites or Microsoft Office 365 or another comparable one called Zoho One. And these basically have things like your Word, your Excel, your PowerPoint equivalents, as well as your communication tools like emails and IMs and videos and, and so on. So um, very critical pieces of your technology infrastructure. Um, just a quick note here about uh, Christian educators and their attitude or posture towards technology. This is a part of one slide from a larger talk I do about faith and technology. Um, I always say that you know, God had endow God endowed human humanity with the ability to create technology. You know, it is good. It's a God-given gift. And I think as uh, Christian educators, we need to embrace technology, even if we don't understand it or don't like it or don't want to use it. That's something you know, we, we need to begin to change our mindset to embrace it. But at the same time, I want to say that as with every human creation, uh, technology is subject to the curse. You know, as Christian educators, we need to use technology in reflective and redemptive ways whenever possible. Um, we want to be critical about how we use it. We want to be critical about the way we use it, uh, the, 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 the impact it has on our students. Uh, and thirdly, I think technology can be used uh, to honor God or to advance um, human sin, you know, to put it simply. You know, um, as Christian educators, you know, we can help our students honor God and love people in, in very profound ways, especially in online contexts. Now, we are modeling how we can use technology in a productive, beneficial, uh, meaningful way, and as opposed to sort of a um, you know, less, less ideal way. And then lastly, I think since technology offers so many affordances, you know, it, I, it can become a counterfeit God in the words of Tim Keller, who is a pastor in New York here. Uh, we need to learn how to speak truth to technology's power to become like God. Uh, online learning can become all-consuming students teachers can feel like they're always on all the time and so I always encourage online um, course uh, uh, students and faculty to take digital Sabbath say no from this time to this time I'm not going to be on my in in the course so I won't be able to respond to your whatever work that's submitted or you know, whatever the the, the Sabbath uh, parameters that are set we need to do that so that we can model good uh, redemptive reflective uses of technology to our students and 
here are some more questions that for, for you to ponder. So, and so we talked about tech, uh, technology, we talked about leadership. So my, my remaining three topics are gonna be a little more practical, something that hopefully all of you would be able to benefit even, you know, um, it, it, the, even if you're an online school already, you know, that there are things here that will be beneficial to you. All right, so instructional design. Um, it may be a familiar term to you. Uh, it may be a new term to some of you, uh, but the, the idea of instructional design is basically a systematic uh, process of how you build learning in a remote online setting. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, what happened with many schools that were doing online learning for the first time, it wasn't really online learning. You know, they were just uploading PowerPoints, uploading PDFs, uploading notes, and that, that really wasn't uh, really well thought out. And so what instructional design is about is it's putting the learner first. It's about making sure that the learning and the content makes sense as you, you know, put that online. Here's just a, a, a graphic that I put together to kind of illustrate some of the uh, affordances of online learning and also some of the design considerations. So you have things, you know, the, the major affordances of online learning as you know, we've talked about is this idea of anytime, anywhere learning. Uh, learners can access this content anytime, anywhere from any device as long as you have access to those things. Uh, but because they can do that, we need to then think about things like mobile first. Uh, there are parts in the world where you know, the mobile device is the only computing device that students have. So how will they see their content on a small phone uh, when you're designing for a big screen? And that's you know, some of the things that we need to think about and how we design. Uh, it also, you know, th this idea of chunking is about taking large amounts of content and putting it into smaller pages, especially for smaller devices where if you can put things in a way that you can scroll through as opposed to having you know, to you know, move the screen left and right, up and down to see everything. You know, I don't know if you ever had experience reading a PDF document on a small phone. It's a very frustrating experience because you have to go left, right, you have to go up, down. It's like trying to find Waldo as you're reading. It just, it's not a fun experience. And then this idea of learning control. I'm actually going to come back to that uh, in a little bit. Uh, another affordance of online learning is this idea of engage, engaging content. We can do things that it's hard to do, I think, in a uh, face-to-face course, like you know, images and videos and simulations and adaptive assignments. I mean, this it's, this opens up the whole world of what we can do with online learning. But with that comes things like multimedia learning and universal learning and multimodal learning. And these are just fancy terms to describe different ways of approaching how we use these um, digital um, content. You know, the, there are principles guiding how you use images, there are principles guiding how you use video, there are principles guiding how you do sort of the simulations. And, and these are things that we need to be at least cognizant of as we design online courses. Like I said, I'm gonna cover a little bit of these concepts in, uh, in my uh, next few slides. And then finally, this idea of differentiated learning. Uh, because uh, especially with online asynchronous courses, that's a self-paced uh, experience. So students really do feel like they want to have a personal experience and if they want to move farther ahead quicker, can they do that in the way it's designed or is our modules all locked up that you have to, everybody kind of is in sync and they can't move further along until everybody's done and sort of how a face-to-face -face course would be. And so you have things that you need to think about in terms of learning pathways and conditional releases and accommodations that you need to think about. So Richard Mayer um, in 2001 wrote, a, I'd say a foundational book for you know, that it applies to online learning. I, I know a lot of you probably are familiar with his work, um, but if you're not, uh, he wrote this one book called Multimedia Learning. He's from, uh, I believe, MIT, no, actually Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara. And he um, basically in his book laid out 12 major principles of multimedia learning. And again, in 2001, there was no iPhone and so, um, things were a little different, but I think a lot of those principles remain, like this idea of learner control. Um, when you 
offer a learner a video, for example, of a lecture. They can play it, they can pause it, they can fast forward it. I usually watch lectures in two times speed because I know I, I value my time. Um, but you know, students who maybe English is their second language may want to slow it down by half speed. Uh, so it's full control of the content. That's something that we want to think about when we create online learning for our students as much as we can. Uh, and that's why synchronous learn online is not as um, effective in many ways as asynchronous because the asynchronous allows students to move at their own pace. Uh, the segmenting principle or chunking principle, like I mentioned earlier, is how do you take one big content and break it up into smaller ones? You look the way my presentation is put together. I have five major topics and I broke it up into you know, little chunks and then each chunk goes about you know, between five to ten minutes. And cognitively, there's, um, there's been studies that and show that the brain can only hold at most two to three things at the same time before it gets overwhelmed. And so, uh, you know, when you design courses, you want to make sure you, you, you chunk it well. Uh, this idea of multimedia principle is, is making sure words and pictures used together uh, is more effective than words alone. So the way I design my slides typically, yeah, there's a word, there's some text, but then there's some images, sort of this example. You now, when you say a dog, there's a, a, there's a word that refers to it, and that's how you can reinforce learn, because there are cognitive tracks in your brain that you know, work together to produce learning. And if you can put those together, the better. And then the last principle is this idea of coherence. Uh, you don't want any additional information if not necessary. Uh, in my slides, I, I eliminate things that are not necessary. If it's on the slide, it's important. If it's, on, if it's not on here, it's not important, at least no, that according to the subject matter expert. And so you have to kind of think about these things when you're designing online courses so that students don't get you know, lost in a rabbit trail and going down paths that may not be the essential information, but rather it's, you know, it's, they want to stick to the main path. Related to sort of these design principles is there's the process. You know, Addy is a very popular design, instructional design framework that some of you may have heard of. And it stands for each step of the process of how you design online courses. And you start with analysis and design and develop and you go all the way through uh, evaluation. And each step of the process takes into consideration some of the, the principles I just mentioned and, and others. Uh, for example, accessibility. I mean, that's a big area that is just, I think, a, oversight in many online courses. Now, students who have a hard of hearing or uh, sight issues, how do they you know, participate in online courses you know, when, when they have those kinds of uh, physical sort of barriers? And so it's something that I think if you apply a model like <coughs> Addy, it, <coughs> excuse me, it gives you uh, important moments in that process to think through these issues so that you are intentional about how you design things. Um, this is a great resource from Arizona State University. Um, like I said, I will share these slides out. Uh, Nicole will, and you can go back and, re and reference it. Uh, but Arizona State University has a great website on course design. It is meant for sort of start a faculty who have no back, like very little to no background on how to design and build courses. And it walks you through the steps of doing that. Um, there's also you know, many other um, examples that they give you that gives you like ways to think about you know, how you can build your, uh, your online course. And, and finally, here are just my, some of my questions for you to consider. You know, um, is there somebody at your school that is thinking about instructional design? If not, I would highly encourage you, strongly encourage you to, to start having people. Union University just you now for the first time in its 30 plus year history hired an instructional designer. Now, we actually hired an instructional designer as well as a user interface person. And their main job is to advocate for the learner. Now, they go in the courses, they look at how it's designed, they say, well, this is confusing for the learner. How can we change that? How do we make that better? How do we you know, improve sort of the, the overall learning outcomes for the students? So that's something that I highly encourage all schools to do, even if they've been doing online for a long time. Uh, some of the design principles, now, if you have a chance to review some of your courses, you, know, um, you might want to consider looking at some of these principles and say, are we adhering to these principles? And these principles are well researched. You know, they've been proven time and time again that they work. They're important. So make sure you, know, you, you try to apply those as much as you can. So I'm going to now switch over to faculty training. 
uh, another you know, important topic, you know, and this is I, where I spend half of my job at AP doing. Uh, I work with faculty uh, in terms of their use of technology and teaching online and training them to be certified to be online teachers. Uh, this is a, a survey result from a 2017 study. Um, and you can see there's a love-hate relationship uh, with technology. And this includes online faculty, if you could believe it. Uh, online faculty actually have a love-hate relationship with it too. You can see that in the first result shows that they all agree that online learning will make higher education accessible to more students. They all believe in that. Uh, they also believe that higher education can be made more affordable if we do online learning. But then when you start getting to this next uh, question about the, the number of faculty teaching, uh, it, no, that, that the myth, I'd say, that, that there'll be less faculty needed if we do more online learning, especially at a face-to-face -face school. That's where they start to, uh-oh, I, I don't know if I can stand behind this thing because if, if I do, I might lose my job or, or some of my colleagues might lose their job or we, we will be, you know, less important and that's where you can start seeing that in the results and then in terms of pedagogical breakthrough you know again some of the myths around online learning is that you cannot build online learning to be the equal quality as uh, as face-to-face as -face. and therefore it's just not going to be effective and that you can see that students know that that's where this last i mean this is a very biased uh result towards online learning and again these include online instructors not just face-to-face -face instructor. So it's very insightful in terms of you know, the results. Uh, this graphic here um, kind of illustrates all the important skill sets and important considerations that online faculty uh, need to think about. I don't know about your institution, but that, you know, at APU and also at Union, uh, we do a lot of faculty development, uh, usually monthly seminars and, and webinars on just helping our, our faculty uh, get some of these skills or improve some of these skills. Uh, things like you know, instructor presence, for example, is a key part of online learning. You know, um, the idea that you're doing this through a virtual machine, it can this disembodied experience can feel a little you know, isolating and foreign and 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 almost in person very impersonal cold and so what I try to do and, and encourage our faculty is to create a video announcement every week if it's a asynchronous course and that way they get to really put their personality behind it and and be able to share that with their students and so that it feels a lot more personal and and warm compared to just you know typing out their their announcement for the week uh, and if they have synchronous sessions you know holding virtual office hours that's a great way to have instructor presence even if the course itself is asynchronous you will still have the opportunity to interact with the students in real time uh, there's also things like prompt feedback here i think um, Online students are constantly trying to figure out how they're doing in the course. And when, when faculty are not either prompt in their response or they're not really meaningful in their, their feedback, it's not helpful to the learner. You know, they don't get enough information on how they can improve or where they can do better. And that's where I think you know, some of the, you know, like I said, faculty development, faculty training at your institution may be able to help improve the quality of the teaching, the online teaching that's happening at your school. Um, again, another resource from Arizona State University, uh, very, very uh, robust resources. Uh, they, you know, they go through this whole, some of the skills I, I just mentioned in the last slide and, and more, and they have lots of uh, tools and resources that kind of faculty can go through on their own and be able to, uh, you can just share this with your faculty and hopefully this would be just better than what, you know, maybe what they currently have. Uh, another resource here is edtechbooks.org. It's a great library of free textbooks on educational technology. Uh, I recommend this to a lot of faculty in my first session, especially um, the folks uh, that, you know, in schools where there's just very little resources for faculty training and development. And the faculty are on their own and, you know, they don't, they can't even afford books that sometimes. And so this is where, you know, you can go to this library and you can find books that uh, faculty can read and learn more about how they can be better, more effective as an online instructor, as better uh, users of technologies from K-12 all the way to higher education. Um, 
Quality Matters is a quali online quality organization. They serve not just the US, but globally, they all the schools, uh, many, many continents. And they, they are one of the leaders to ensure online learning. Uh, they have you know, rubrics and standards. You can just go to the website and, and use that as a way to do your assessment of your existing courses and existing programs. Uh, another similar organization is called the Online Learning Consortium. This is the one that we use at uh, APU. Uh, we use their scorecard uh, which is free, you can download it from their website. And we use their scorecard, which basically lists all the key components of an online program, everything from the leadership level to resources, to the course level, to the actual modules and the teaching of these courses. And they have standards, they have a rubric you can grade. And if you just spend some time you know, use, looking at their rubric, their scorecard, it hopefully can provide you some ways to kind of improve what you're doing at your institution, uh, you know, with very little to no resources up, you know, there's no money you have to pay to get this. You can just, you know, get that from, from their website. Um, here are some questions for you to ponder amongst your, your colleagues, um, you know, just how, how you view online learning and you know, attitudes, you know, are, you, like I said, even with online instructors and online schools, there are bias that exists that need to be addressed because if there are those people that will continue to teach online that have these bias, uh, the quality will always be limited because of the bias. And so we want to make sure we address that as much as we can. Um, and then, Finally, I'm going to just uh, breeze through this and then we'll have some time for conversation. Um, student support or the role of students in online learning. I, I know they shouldn't be last, but you know, this is where I say the last, uh, just because they're mentioned last doesn't mean they're the least important. If anything, I, I save the best for last. Uh, in 2010, there was a major meta study that was done by the Department of Education in the United States. They looked at uh, over a thousand studies you know, from, from around the world. Just thousand studies that were, were conducted about online learning and they found that fully online courses perform marginally better. I want to say that again. Online courses perform marginally better than face-to-face -face counterpart. This was a major you know, study because that was for the first time you know, that this statement was made so boldly and publicly and widely in the field. You know, they, they say that the only thing that trumps the online course experience is this blended hybrid courses where you have a little mix of both. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, it's, it's a worthy studies, a worthy study to, to look at. But of course, with any educational studies, there is always going to be counterparts and then people that will criticize the previous study and what they've done. And so this follow up study was done the same year, a couple months later, and basically they say, yes, Online courses is better than face-to-face -face courses on the whole, but there are gonna be some students that will be disadvantaged by the online learning platform. And we've already talked about some of these issues already in earlier conversations. Um, but you no, know, especially in this study, they, they looked at low income and they looked at underprepared students. So low income students oftentimes face the same issues that students in you know, other developing countries or developing areas where access to computing devices and access technology was not a, a thing that they have. And so that became a barrier to their success. And then in terms of underprepared students, you know, these are students who never really were prepared to be independent and in some of the, you know, uh, doing the work on their own. The asynchronous learning requires a lot of motivation on the student part. Uh, in my next slide, I'll share some of the characteristics of what online, successful online students look like. And a lot of the underprepared students just don't have those skills yet. And so I think schools need to work on helping them equip Help equipping them to be successful so that they can do well in online. Here are some of the skills. I think, you know, if you look at what a successful online learner needs to have, you know, on the right side are the, the basic stuff we talked about. But, you know, I want to say, especially in, in the midst of quarantine, this is something in, uh, is very becoming more prevalent for a lot of uh, students is having a good study environment is maybe not possible. Some of them live in, in places where they don't have their own private 
bedroom or their own corner of the house. I mean, they're just not able to find a good study environment, so that impedes their learning. Uh, but there's also other things like time management skills and communication skills, technical skills that are key, and then as well as you know, persistence. You know, if you log in and I don't know, it drops you and you log in, it drops you and you have to keep logging in uh, to make sure you know, that it's that grit sometimes it requires to be successful in an online context. And then issues of motivation and independence is also important to consider. And um, I would be remiss to not talk about integrated learning with ICHE. And um, this is a definition that I, uh, I've sort of adopted from the ICHE uh, definition. And my, my point here is that even if we're doing online learning, we need to think about how do we uh, continue to push personal and social transformation? Uh, how do we do character development and value you know, uh, um, formation and meaning and purpose? All those things that sometimes we forget to do in an online context because you now we you know we don't have sort of the before class and after class conversations with our students and so i think um you know again this is more of a reminder and just to let you know i will stick around after uh this formal time together to kind of have a little you know after hour uh, uh session for those who want to have time to stick around and this is where we can sort of talk through some of the things that sort of like now after a speaker in a real life session you you can go up to them and talk to them about you know what you've just heard um you know i i don't like generally when you go to a webinar and then the time ends and everybody gets locked out and you have no more conversation and, and it just feels a disrupt, very a premature disruptive experience. So um, here, here are just some of the human skills I think we need to continue to develop amongst our students, whatever discipline we're in, in the online context. And you know, I, again, this is coming from a, a talk I gave last year in, um, in Taiwan for ICHG, and I went a little more in depth there about how these are important skills that are just increasingly more important and how do we develop these things in an online context. And finally, here are some of the questions for you to consider, uh, some books for you to read, more books, uh, more resources, and now we can have a conversation. So, I'm a so this is a blogger I follow. Um, he recently you know, had a blog that had a quote that I just thought was so fitting for what we're talking about here. He says that you have complete control we have complete control over our actions and we can choose to act like this pandemic is the end of days or a new beginning. Um, at the start of my talk, you know, I said that the, uh, the COVID-19 was the beginning of an ice age, you know, what um, some have argued. And if that's the case, I think you know, the pandemic can be seen as new beginning, you know, and it's one that has lots of new opportunities and new possibilities. Uh, and as Christian educators, I think we need to go beyond sort of reacting to the present. I think that's something a lot of schools and a lot of leaders are doing right now. They're just reacting, reacting, reacting. Uh, instead, we need to shift our mindset to uh, preparing and, and planning and responding to the future because it's there. That's where the impact will be because there will be a new normal whenever the quarantine's done, whenever there's, it's safe to go back to school and all that. But what then? You know, are we gonna be better off as an institution or not? And I know that many of us are from institutions that are small with limited resources, limited personnel, and we can't do everything, especially what everything I propose in my talk. I mean, even AP with its many vast resources, we cannot do everything. But you no, know, uh, each of us in our institution, we can do something. You know, not everything, but we can do something. And the question is, what do we want to do well? And you pick one or two things, whether it's instructional design, whether it's supporting students, whether it's supporting faculty, you pick one thing and we, you excel in that. And that is the beginning of how you can improve. Um, and as we know now in history, you know, wars, earthquakes, famines, tsunamis, and now the pandemic, following each of these major crises, uh, we have always been resilient as a community, especially an education community. Uh, and, and in many ways, it's out of these crises that we find innovative 
better new ways of doing things that are better than it was before. And so I believe that this current pandemic will unite educators, educational institutions, and hopefully humanity and it reminds us that um, we need to invest in the future generation. You know that this new online learning platform that we're talking about, uh, that's going to be the platform for the future for many, many students. And so um, I hope and my prayer is that you know, we will collectively be able to model for them uh, what online learning can be and how it can, you know, solve the issues of costs and access and quality. Um, and so it, you know, so anyway, that, so that's, that's where I'll end. And uh, thank you for your time and your engagement. And like I said, I will uh, stick around till, um, till there are no more, no one else uh, to answer any questions or have further uh, conversation for those who, who want to. So thank Mike, you. Mike, I want to just say thank you on behalf of ICHE. Mike has been working a lot today. He, uh, as I mentioned to you at the outset of this, he conducted this same, um, uh, webinar uh, resource track um, 12 hours ago for the other half of the world. And uh, I've got to say, Mike, that this is a gold standard as far as I'm concerned. And I've, I've noted a lot of comments from people. I've uh, been in touch with Nicole already via text and said, we will be planning where we need to think through whether we do this on a quarterly basis. And I said, make sure that Mike is the coach to anybody else who's putting together a uh, resource track on online because this is just absolutely seamless. Uh, I wanna, uh, Solomon got on a little bit late. I wanna remind you that uh, Nicole will be sending out uh, Mike's presentation to all of you so that you have that in PowerPoint form. And I want to also remind you to ask, or to ask you rather, to please send Nicole your comments and most importantly, your suggestions for topics for future um, resource tracks like this on, in a virtual way. And of course, I want to invite you to put on your calendar now next, uh, next June. It will likely be in the second week of June in Zurich, Switzerland for the uh, global ICHG gathering. So those are a few housekeeping matters. And of course, let me know if there's anything that ICHE can do for you. Nicole in Boise, Idaho, Director of Administration, Santosh Nyanakan, Bangalore, Director of Communications, uh, Dr. Ruben Van Rensburg in Johannesburg, Director of Accreditation, uh, Dr. Francis Wu in Azusa, Director of Programs and Collaboration. So um, thank you, Mike, so much. We're, I'm going to dismiss in a word of prayer and then hang around if you want to stand at the front of the church at the altar and chat <laughs> with uh, Dr. Truong. So Lord, let your grace be upon each one and each school represented here. Thank you for the wisdom that you've given to Mike and his generosity in sharing it with us. Go with us now with your peace, your protection, and your comfort to each person, to their families, and to the concerns of the ministry that they have. In Jesus' name, amen.